To describe the work of Alexei Tintarenko is to describe something that to me stretches beyond photography. But it's also not really something that we can say has having a painterly quality about it. The tones, the depiction of people, places, it's almost like the materialization of a certain philosophy, a certain way of seeing life and the world that more than stretching to encompass words that cannot be there, focuses instead on the experience of diving into the depths of what can lie beyond the single image. And that is, my friends, how I would describe the evocative work of Alexei Titarenko. Titarenko has quite an interesting upbringing in a sense that once one begins to read about his personal experience, events in his life, people and creative influences, they all fit together as pieces of a puzzle that once completed materializes itself in the images the photographer produces. So let us now quote his words. During the 60s, my family had a small room of 15 square meters in a communal apartment in Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. There, I lived with my parents, grandmother and aunt. And as a child, I often disturbed them, mostly at dawn, because I woke very early. To put an end to this situation, the adults taught me how to read. And reading affected me profoundly, stimulating my imagination and sensibility giving me the desire to dream and especially to dream while taking walks. Reading also altered my vision of the surrounding reality, endowing it with mystery and intrigue. A burning desire to see the hidden aspects of things overtook me. At such moments, I experienced an excitement that I had never felt before. I sensed an invitation to discover an unknown substance, material or spiritual. And around the same time, someone gave me an old pre-war camera. And listening to these words, I think both you and me can see where this leads. Eventually, this burning desire and excitement intersected with photography and Titarenko began to perceive the camera as a key to another world, almost. Later in life, and a bit by chance, he was hired as an assistant to the administrator to the famous Grand Hall of the St. Petersburg Philharmonica, where he had the opportunity of listening to a classical music concert almost every day. And as the artist describes, music became a tremendous influence for his work has, quote, music offered me an emotional dimension to everything that presented itself to my senses. It invited me to interpret things without ideological color in a more universal, a more humane and honest way, and it provided an escape from Soviet reality, where all arts were considered instruments of propaganda and there was no space for the expression of an authentically personal sentiment. And nothing has more importance in this whole sentence I quoted you now than perhaps the idea of a Soviet reality where things were not quite what they seem. Meaning that behind this idea of order, discipline and authority were feelings and ideas that Titarenko, like many other artists of this period, represented in their work. And when talking about his work, one of the earliest and perhaps more impactful bodies he produced was titled City of Shadows and reflects, in a way, these feelings and ideas. At the basis of this body of work was an impulse and Titarenko describes this impulse as, quote, coming from an understanding that there's something visually important that can translate the situation of what was happening with people. It was a way to describe by means of a visual language what was happening with the people in the Soviet Union. They were not just human beings, they became signs that could be erased, they became shadows. And these, if you ask me, are portraits of something that is far more complex to describe and to put into words. Human condition. In particular, the condition of the Russian people after the collapse of the Soviet Union, where it is described that people faced many hardships and suffering. And to illustrate this, the photographer resorted to different sources of inspiration, such as the novels of the great Dostoevsky, the music of Dmitry Shostakovich, the films of Sergei Eisenstein, or the visual art of Alexander Khodchenko. 
and methods such as long exposure, intentional camera movement, so as to create blur and an elaborate printmaking process to communicate ideas and feelings common to many through a unique style of street photography. And it was this body of work produced in the late 90s that won Alexei Titarenko's international recognition. And looking at other bodies of work by Alexei Titarenko, we quickly identify his unique style in different places. Different European cities, Havana, the capital of Cuba, and even streetscapes in the US are captured within the same style. But how does he create this style exactly? According to my research and video footage I had access to, I can pinpoint the specific camera with which Titarenko made most of his work, a medium format Hasselblad camera. And whilst earlier in his career he did work in a collage and photomontage style, mainly to produce his 1983 nomenclatura of signs, his work was thereafter based on a single exposure, taken with different black and white films over time. So what's the trick, you might ask? Well, the darkroom. It's not at random that some have called Titarenko one of the greatest modern masters of the darkroom, because his beautiful prints are crafted precisely in the darkroom through different techniques of bleaching and toning, whilst also exposing his print to light along the process, which creates nuances and different tonal ranges of grey, which therefore brings a certain beauty and ambiguity to his work. Now, a valid question to ask is, what does this all mean, this style? Does it mean that Titarenko sees the world as a bleak place? Or is it in any way pessimistic? Well, as I usually say, the answer really depends on the viewer. Personally, when I take a look at his work, I don't see it as much as bleak, but rather ambiguous and artistic, evocative, if you will, would be the right word. I see it as something that transcends the idea of just a photograph, just a recording in time, to touch on the idea of memory and a much more complex idea of time. Perhaps due to the mix of black and white with this veil of grey, his images seem to me, at least, to be an experience in itself, because your mind is not suspended, but rather tries to find answers to make sense, to absorb the beauty and the hidden meanings of it. To me, it also speaks on the importance of creativity, of human empathy and human sensibility. Interestingly enough, when looking at these images, I asked myself, is it possible for a photographer to become an artist? And if so, when does a photographer become an artist? And perhaps inspired by the sources of this video, Titarenko's philosophy, or perhaps as well my own liking of Dmitry Shostakovich's compositions, I have to say that I found my answer in the composer's words. And he wrote, art destroys silence. And when I read this, I began to ask myself, is it not more powerful when an image, which we all agree in theory has no sound presence, can speak louder than many words combine, than many words intertwine? Well, it is. So to me, the ability of those singular individuals like the Titarenkos, Soul Lighters and Ernst As of this world to stop being just photographers and become artists stems primarily from the fact that their images disrupt silence. That even when you look at them by yourself in complete and utter stillness, you can still hear the sounds of that scene, a music if there is one, the sound of a memory, whatever it is. And there is a consciousness that you find yourself immersed in that still image that has touched you and taken you way beyond where a simple recording of time cannot take you. And I guess this is the end of the line for Alexei Titarenko today, but hopefully um, I'd love to bring him soon to the channel, maybe a book, maybe something we could chat about. Let me know if you'd like that down below. Let me know what your thoughts are in terms of his photography or, you know, people that you recommend me looking into. But now I want to talk about today's sponsor because without them, this video would have been possible. And so you know that, you know, Wondershare 
has been a partner of the channel. Uh, we've been, you know, talking about their products for quite some time now. And so today it's not going to be an exception. Today we're going to be talking about one particular software and that is Wondershare's UniConverter. And although the name suggests what it is, UniConverter is not just a software that converts your files. You can also record your screen, compress your files, download videos from more than 10,000 different video and audio websites, and then you also have access to a whole tool section full of useful softwares that will crop videos, help with subtitles, voice changing, and much, much more. Now the question is, why would you need something like this? Or what would you use Unit Converter for? And I actually can give you a couple of examples of scenarios where I use um, Unit Converter myself. And then of course, leave you with some other possibilities of scenarios where you can use Unit Converter yourself. First and foremost, if I have video files that are tricky to play in different and multiple devices, I can easily drag that file and then convert it into a more mainstream and playable format. If I want to record my screen and add that footage to make my videos more dynamic and add different information, record meetings or important chats that need to be recorded, I can also use UniConverter for that. And the third scenario where I use as well UniConverter would be to download footage or audio from open online sources that I can potentially use in my videos. And then fourth and perhaps very important as well is to be adding quick subtitles to my videos or other footage that I need to be subtitled. The possibilities quite honestly are immense and no matter what field you're in, you're definitely going to inevitably run into a situation where UniConverter could help you. So go ahead and check their website for more info. Links to download UniConverter are down below. But of course, if you'd like a second opinion, you can always go to, you know, reviews websites. I'm going to be leaving two links down below as well. And, you know, we can have a look through the reviews, see what people use UniConverter for, how long they used it for, and etc. Get acquainted as well with software, other opinions, and scenarios where you possibly might benefit from using UniConverter. And of course, the links to their website are down below. And I'd like to thank Wondershare UniConverter for sponsoring today's video, for helping me, you know, keeping the channel going and making it, you know, sustainable as well. So I really, really appreciate that. And I appreciate you if you go and just check the link, just get informed and see if it's for you or not. So with that in mind, I'd also like to thank you for watching, uh, for supporting the channel. It truly means a lot to me. I know I say this in every video, but I mean it. And, you know, it's been really, really incredible to just go through comments, feedback, emails. And quite recently I've done some coaching sessions with some of you. And it was an incredibly rewarding experience for me personally, because I got to put some faces into people, but I also got to, you know, get to know different sides of photography, what different people are doing and have creative chats. And yeah, I guess that that's going to be all for today. If you're interested in checking out uh, the links to my social media, to other stuff, it's down below links to the member community as well. So don't forget about that. And yeah, I wish you all the best. Stay safe, keep shooting, keep creating, keep learning. And I'm out. Peace. Seen it all, you can all been a fit to Fan for talk, I can't fall in love with you Seen it all, you can